Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you this morning. Friends, this is our last week of our Why Sermons series. We've spent the past five weeks asking some basic questions, but have discovered that they have some deep answers. We've explored why we were created and what to do when bad things come our way. We've discovered God's faithfulness. A few weeks ago, we explored the significance of Jesus and learned how he made his grace available to all who choose him. And last week, we explored why we should pray. And we learned that prayer serves the purposes of petition and intercession, confession, forgiveness and forgiving, and thanksgiving. We learned that we shouldn't treat God as a vending machine, expecting the answers to prayer that we want when we pray, because prayer is not about us getting our way, but about our submitting to God's will. So we wrap up the study with one of the most important questions of all. Why church? Friends, many people claim to know God. They even have an understanding or a belief in Jesus. People spend time meditating and studying on God's word and they pray, but I hear it in our world today so many times that they're just over religion, that they're over the church. I'm not going to tell you that some of these folks aren't justified in their feelings. They've been in churches where they've had experiences of corruption, politicking, hypocrisy, and self-centeredness, and that flies right in the face of the nature of Jesus that they read about in the, guys, in the gospel. That's not to say that I have an expectation that Mount Moriah is going to kind of be this essence of perfection. That would be irrational. We're humans. But it also doesn't mean that we can't strive to become more real, more authentic, that we can't own the fact that we may not always see eye to eye. We have to be willing to admit that we're not perfect. But as John Wesley said, we're going on to perfection. It's true. People who are exploring faith or who are shopping for churches are often looking for the wow factor. The church that's got the flash power, the great children's programming, and the knock your socks off worship. And to be completely honest, those are great things, important things, and we're moving in that direction. But it's not all about flash programming and socks being knocked off. People in today's world, especially amongst my generation, the millennials, are incredibly skeptical, and they can smell inauthenticity a mile away. Some churches have all of that flash, but they lack the depth, and there's not a sense that it's anything beyond this kind of masquerade of folks who are living behind a stained glass facade. Churches with flash, they're growing, they're putting people in the seats, but churches that are real and authentic and reaching people, they're growing as well. I want to be a part of a church that's changing lives and striving to be an authentic community first, and then we'll worry about the flash power second. Even still, It doesn't change the fact that in today's age, the church as a whole, the global church, is in decline. We ourselves saw a slight decline in our average attendance last year, but that's the experience of many mainline Christian churches across our nation. So we've got to turn the tide, and we've heard that before. But sadly, I think many of our churches have given up on changing lives and finding that flash power altogether. But I ask, rather than giving in, What if we started doing some new things? What if we started finding some new ways to be real and authentic, getting messy and dirty, realizing that we're not always going to have everything put together? What would it take for us to make that shift from an inward to an outward focus, meaning that the church no longer caters to members but is a center that is working to change the world? It's not about us. It's about the people who are not yet here. It's about the people who don't yet have a relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the change that we're going to have to make if we want to grow and we want the whole church to grow? We're going to have to shift the culture from an inward to an outward focus. We're going to have to make sure that we're working to being real and authentic. That is how the church is going to become a relevant part of our society once again. We're moving now in that direction. And it's going to be painful at times because it means that we're going to have to learn how to say no to some things and accept being told no from time to time. And we're going to have to start asking, how do my actions 
benefit our community instead of asking how the community can benefit me. It's an ongoing conversation, but an important one. But if the church is going to regain its relevance, we've got to get back to the basics and discover what church was about from the very beginning. And a great place to look is in the book of Exodus, chapter 3. We're going to take a look at verses 1 through 12. If you have a Bible, turn with me there. This is a very popular story. It's Moses and the burning bush. But believe it or not, we can learn a lot about how church, how community, how worship was supposed to be structured when we look at this story a little closer. Please hear these words. Moses was keeping flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock beyond the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame out of a fire out of a bush, and he looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. And then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burning up. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt I heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. The story of Moses in the burning bush is one of the most famous and widely known stories. And aside from its vast popularity, we can learn a lot from this encounter. And this morning, I want to point out four lessons that we learn from a bush. And the first lesson is that God is holy. In our passage, God tells Moses, he says, Come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. See, approaching God, it's different than approaching a home or a place of business. It's different than approaching a family member or a friend or even a complete stranger. God is God. And that means when we approach God, we approach him with a level of reverence. The second lesson we learn is that God speaks and provides instruction. Moses, he was out tending a flock. He had no expectations that he was going to meet God that day. His people, however, they were living in exile. They were suffering under the hands of a cruel Pharaoh. God said to Moses, I'm going to send you. I choose you. You are the one who is going to go and save my people. God provided instructions to Moses that he would be the one who would free God's people. God still speaks today, sometimes directly, sometimes through prayer, sometimes through scripture, and sometimes through attending worship service at a church. But God still speaks, and God still provides us with direction and instruction. The third lesson is that God cares for God's people. Folks who argue against the existence of God will often claim that there is no way that this God we talk about who is so loving would ever let all of the bad stuff that happens to people happen to them. God gave us the gift of free will for God to intervene. For God to stop someone from harming someone else means that God would infringe on that gift, something that God has chosen not to do. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't care. God cares deeply, so much so that he sent Jesus. When Moses approached God on the mountain, God said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cry. I know their sufferings. I'm going to deliver them. God knew that the Israelites were suffering and chose to deliver them. God knew 
that we were suffering under this thing called the human condition and through Christ's death and resurrection, we were given the opportunity to be delivered as well. The fourth lesson we learn is that God is to be worshiped. God tells Moses on the mountain that when the people were brought out of Egypt, that they should worship God on the mountain. We're not only supposed to approach God with reverence, but God demands and God deserves our worship. Many people think that worship is the only thing that we do when we gather together as a church. It's the only thing that we do here, but it is so much more than that. It is true. When we come to church, we do come to worship. We do exactly what God told Moses to do on the mountain. We sing, we proclaim, we pray, we gather, we give God praise for being our God. The psalmist writes in Psalm 103.3, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me, bless his holy name. We come to church, we bless God's name because God has blessed us. We also come to church to hear from God. Now, I find this funny because most worship planning committees have lengthy conversations about how to transition from one thing to another in worship without leaving any space for what we call dead air. We don't want there to be silence. Maybe you've been in a room at some point in time and people decided that they were going to pray silently. And it's not long before people start coughing and hacking and umming and making all kind of noise because we live in this world, right? Where we're so accustomed to noise that it's hard for us to be silent. And yet God calls us at times to be still. When we're praying, whether we're doing it at home or at church, are we the only person talking? Remember that God speaks and provides instruction, and we won't hear that unless we stop and listen ourselves. That's why we leave time for silent prayer on Sunday mornings. We use that time to pray, and I would encourage you to take that time to listen as well. After Jesus went to the synagogue for the first time, Mary and, and Joseph, they lost him. And we find in Luke 2, 46, that they searched for him for three days, panicked. Where did they find him? He was in the temple, sitting amongst the teachers, asking them questions, listening to their teaching, learning from them. Jesus took time to listen and to hear from God. And I take that to mean we should as well. We come to church to care for one another. Remember when Moses was on top of that mountain, God told him that God cared for the Israelites, planned to deliver them. Jesus cared for the people he met who were at the margins of society. And Paul told the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 2, to bear one another's burdens, that in this way we would fulfill the law of Christ. You see, we come to church because God cares deeply and intimately for each one of us. Something that we are also called to do is to care deeply and intimately for one another, which can become difficult when we're not around each other. Most folks have come to associate church as being a building, a place that we go to, rather than this idea that it's simply a community. Church is more than a building. Church brings us into community with one another and with God. Our world is filled with many career choices and vocations because we need people with various skills and abilities to make the world work, right? If everyone worked in the plumbing industry, we'd have all of this water, but who's going to engineer that infrastructure? Who's going to build the homes then that, so that we have the sinks and the bathtubs? What would we do without the lights and the electricity? We need a variety of people with a variety of skills to make things work, and the same is true in the church. As a community, it would be irresponsible for us to think that everyone's going to look like, think like, or act just like we do. In Romans 12, Paul tells us that the body has many members and that not all of us have the same function so that we who are many can be one, can be one movement, one body in Christ, that individually we are members of one another. Together with our many gifts and abilities, we are one. We form a community. We need each other deeply. Why is this so important? In an age when an increasing percentage of our relationships and business are tended to through electronic mediums, we're losing one-to-one -one relationships. And the church is one of the last places on earth where people can still come and they can still interact with one another. 
rather than through a text, an email, or friending someone on Facebook. Now, all of these tools are great. Social media is a wonderful thing when it is used as a tool. When it becomes our primary source of socialization, we tend to feel like we're missing something. Many people, and again, especially folks that are in my generation, that millennial generation, we've grown up during this age of technological advances, and we've watched as the shutdown between one-on-one -on -one relationships more towards technology has happened. And what we're finding is that a lot of folks are out there and they're searching because they feel like there's this hole in their life, and they're looking for ways to fill that hole, and they're finding that they're filling it when they enter into real relationships with people, but they're looking for authentic and genuine relationships. That's why the words in Hebrews 10 are so important to us. The writer says, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, some people were choosing not to be a part of the community. And the author was warning against that, saying we've got to bring out the best in each other. We have to work to be bringing out the best in each other so that we can begin to work to bring out the best in others in our world. That's how we develop authenticity, when we care more about the other than when we do for ourselves. As a church, it's also important that we invite others. In Matthew 4, we read that Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee and he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter and Andrew, his brother. They were throwing their nets out into the sea. They were fishing. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in the boat with their father mending their nets. And Jesus called to them. He said, come, follow me. And they left their father. They left their boat and they went with him. From the time Jesus' ministry began, it was an invitational ministry, and that invitation never went away. Everywhere Jesus went, he was always calling people to come to him, to join his movement. But somewhere along the way, a lot of churches stopped moving. They became content to stay put. We have to reignite that desire to invite. We're all here because someone invited us even if you've been in church your entire life, the people who brought you as a baby invited you. They opened the door to a relationship with Jesus Christ for you. Who are we not to extend and pass that invitation forward? Church is more than Sunday mornings, too. We spend time, or at least we should spend time during the week in personal devotion. Some of you are attending Bible studies or share groups, and soon many of us will begin meeting through our life groups in order to continually come into God's presence with others, to listen for and to hear God's instruction, to care for one another and to be cared for, and to learn about God and to go deeper in Scripture, to worship and to be in community with one another. We do all of this stuff because it blesses us. It fills that need that we have in our soul for community, for relationships with one another and with God. We do this stuff because we encounter God when we be the church and do church together. So why church? It gives us a place, moreover, a community where we can listen and learn from God, where we can care for others and we can experience others caring for us. A way that we can worship the great God that we serve, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus spent his entire ministry welcoming and inviting others to be a part of his movement Church isn't one location, it's a people, and it's not a stagnant people. It's a moving people. How are you moving? For the sake of the church and for the sake of the kingdom of God, and who will you invite to move with you? As you move, I pray that you will encounter, that you will listen to, that you will receive, and that you will worship God as together we become church we go to church, and we do church together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of the church. We pray especially that we would not selfishly keep it to ourselves, but that we would take the blessings of community and care out into our world, that we would extend an invitation to someone else to join us. 
and that we would keep extending invitations, knowing that our work remains unfinished until every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. Help us to recognize that we are standing on holy ground to see your image in the faces of one another and in the people we encounter in the world. Help us to listen. Help us to care and lead us to worship. For you are a great God indeed and worthy to be praised. Be with us now and always, we pray. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. Friends, one of the greatest gifts of the church is the gift of community. And starting next week, we're going to have the opportunity to take the community that is church one step deeper through something we're calling life groups. We're launching those groups next week as a way to take the sense of community and connectedness that we feel in this place outside and to be a part of something, a part of this community throughout the week. Our life groups are going to gather at least twice a month. And when they gather, they're going to pray for and with one another. They're going to go deeper on the sermon topics or a topical study that the leader or the group may decide that they want to follow. They're going to serve together at least once a quarter and they're going to invite others from within the church and within our community to come and to be a part of the new thing that God is doing among us. These groups will be about 10 to 16 people. And we hope that they will become groups where you get to do life together and that they will go beyond this Lenten study and that they will be a group that you come to look forward to being a part of. Sign-ups are still available. If you have a question about life groups or what might be right for you, you can see me, give me a call, or email me. And we encourage you, if you haven't done so already, to begin reading the book Love Does. We'll start that series next week, and we're using that study to kick off and be our first study as our life groups meet, but we're also using it as our Lenten study. So even if you're not discerning that a life group is right for you right now, you can still join us and be a part of that study, and I hope you will. Friends, may God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and be with you always. We'll see you next week.